people have have gotten a lot more comfort with advisors and people online and they can kind of quickly figure out who knows what they what they know and you know the the the, the higher end clients also have teams of advisors so they quickly can kind of separate the the wannabes from those who really know what they're doing and I'm not saying I'm I'm a genius, but if you do anything for three plus decades, you get pretty good at it. What have you noticed as a general trend with um, these people that are leaving Canada, you know, the United States, and moving themselves to these countries um, that purportedly will treat them better on the uh, tax levels? Like, is there a common theme that you've noticed in their lives? Sure. So, so one of the things to understand is the revenue model of a progressive tax tax system. Whether you think it's fair or not, what ends up happening is the top 1% account for anywhere from a third to 40% of the total tax revenue. Mm. So the government needs money. If you th- if you run any type of business and, and one out of 100 of your customers is bringing in a third to 40% of your revenue, you kind of want to know about those customers. Well, if you think of those customers, they are people who much more tend to be location independent. They can run their business from, they don't have to be standing on the shop floor overlooking somebody. Um, They have skills, et cetera, which they can either put online or they can manage their money online. And so they're much less sticky from a business point of view. The result is you only need a small number of those golden geese, as we call them, to leave to hu- have a huge negative asymmetric impact on the total tax revenue that they, the, the subtitle of our book was how the 1% affect the 99%. Well, you only need a small number of the 1% to leave to leave a huge hole in you know, the, the, the government revenues for those left behind. And that's, so the trend I've really seen is that people are, are really discovering their mobility. Um, we've probably all seen the, the kind of little map of Manhattan, like the center of the world, and you know a few bridge and tunnels over to New Jersey, and the rest of the world's kind of very small. And you had people, whether they were in Manhattan or Toronto or London or Silicon Valley, who had very you know, cultivated lives. They really lived within five square blocks. They went to the same restaurants, they went to the same work, they, you know, socialize with the same people, they have the same amusements, and they they couldn't really dream of overcoming this life inertia. Well, COVID came in, and they were kind of kicked out of town mm-hmm. one step ahead of COVID, and they were sitting up there in the Hamptons or somewhere else, and sitting there going, listening to the New York City mayor race, and they're all talking about how they're going to crank up the, the tax rate there, or people are sitting and listening to, you know, um, uh, Mr. Trudeau and his deputy prime minister who wrote a book called Plutocrats, Christia Freeland, and, you know, the equivalents in different ger- different other countries. And they started saying, What's well, that book about, by the way? Sorry, what's that? What's that book about, by the way? I've not heard of it. Plutocrats? Yeah. Uh, it's Christia Freeland talking about how the rich are ruining the, the world for the rest of us. Oh, okay. So it's the rich's <laughs> fault again, of course. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so these people are sitting there saying, well, you know, honey, um, our favorite restaurant, there's this thing called Uber Eats. They'll deliver it to our door. And there's this, you know, Google Teams and Zoom and Skype. And, you know, we've got out of Manhattan and the world didn't collapse. And, you know, I, we can actually reproduce our lifestyle. And mm-hmm. now I've got this, the distance that I'm listening to what, you know, now the frog has jumped out of the water and they're now going, that's pretty hot water. I don't know if I want to go back in. Yeah. And so then they start thinking about, <clears throat> okay, well, we've already got a place in Florida. Let's relocate to Florida. So that's where you see, you've seen the max exodus of people, the high end people from New York who went, went to Florida and New York city has a city surtax. And so it's seen a 40% drop in their projections for tax revenues simply because some of the people have, have picked up and moved to Florida. And you'll get, and one of the key things to understand today is you, you need to really do it. I've had some people saying, well, you know, I'm not really going to move to Florida, but they'll never know. And then I'll say, you do have a cell phone, right? Yeah. That's pinging off a tower every second or so. And they know exactly where you're at. 
I mean, just like the visitors to the uh, the Capitol on January 6th, the police figured out where they were at. Well, they're going to figure out, you know, that you're standing in New York at going to your favorite bodega, buying, you know, your milk and, and cookies. Um, so they're very good. And the onus is on you to prove that you've moved to Florida. It's not on the on the tax authorities to move that to prove that you haven't left New York. And so that's where you need proper kind of advice you need to execute, but the opportunities are tremendous because people can much more reproduce their lifestyle independent of a specific location than they could in the past. Yeah, it's, you know, it's bizarre to me. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned that point about uh, like how much of an impact it has in the tax system when high net worth individuals just pick up and move and just take everything with them to another place. Cause that, cause that does affect the less fortunate folk because there's less money to, um, I guess, steal from the rich and give to the poor sort of thing. How, what kind of effect does that have on the economy? Like over the longer term? Oh, a huge effect. It, there, you have to look at, um, if we look at Canada, Australia, the UK, for example, all of those jurisdictions have a VAT tax, a GST, mm -hmm. HST. The United States does not. So the United States, when you look at the total kind of pie of their government revenue, they don't have that VAT wedge. So that's why the United States, it's actually even higher, um, uh, a, a greater dependence. So you just need a much smaller number to leave and they've got a, a huge impact. So when you have people like Elizabeth Warren who are saying, well, you know, we're not, it's the, the rhetoric move from let's get money for good stuff to let's take money from bad people. Well, you know, <laughs> that doesn't go over very well at, at the negotiating table. And, and many of my clients are sitting there saying, yeah, I can contribute more. I will, but you know, when you start the conversation with selling beer mugs, saying billionaires tears, mm -hmm. that's not a very productive conversation. So thank you very much. I'm going to leave, and and I will decide what's going to happen to that money, whether to lifestyle, whether to my children, whether to strategic philanthropy. I mean, uh, uh, it was very revealing this past week when ProPublica produced his stuff. They asked Warren Buffett, and he said, "Well." Of course, it makes more sense for me to give it to a charity than to give it to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. 